about 40 hours. So I'm in, a, in, the, in the warp zone. <laughs> okay, um, what we're going to talk about is the MHC, you have already been told by Dr. McCallip, the structure and its role in, an, in immune response, specific immune response, especially antigen presentation and recognition by T cells. What I'm going to talk about is uh, what, the, what the genes are, what the gene products are, how they associate to make those molecules that he showed you. Okay. Uh, I will also um, talk about its relevance in transplantation, organ transplants. Um, Okay, so the, what we are going to cover is um, what is MHC, as I already showed you, major histocompatibility complex. Um, its product is HLA, human leukocyte antigen. The reason it is named human leukocyte antigen because that's where it was first detected. And for a long time, leukocytes were used to they still are, to recognize, identify the antigenic makeup of a person who is either a, a donor for, of a transplant, an organ donor, or a recipient of an organ transplant. So HLA is, stands for uh, human leukocyte antigen. Um, I'll tell you a little bit, just a tiny little bit, so that you don't fall asleep, about mice as well, because most of the discovery was made in mice. And you may come across in your text and in some other uh, experimental sort of uh, demonstration of certain immunological phenomena, mice or mouse tissues. And in mice, it's known as H2. And obviously, there's an H1 and H3 and H4, but you don't have to concern yourself with those. Okay? In addition to the major histocompatibility antigens, there are a number of minor, uh, minor histocompatibility antigens as well. And why are they important, although I'm not going to talk a lot about it because that, there are that many of them, because they also contribute to the fate of graft. And if you have got lots of disparity between the recipient and donor in minor histocompatibility antigens, then graft can just as easily rejected, as quickly rejected, as the disparity in major histocompatibility antigens in the MHC. Uh, that's about all I will say about minor. So that just you have some appreciation that it's not the major histocompatibility antigen that is all that controls graft rejection. The significance, role in immune responses, you have heard a lot about it. And since it has a role in, in immune responses, it also determines our susceptibility or resistance to certain infections. Teleologically, of course, we have evolved to have those MHCs that protect us. And consequently, susceptibility to infection, also autoimmune diseases are associated with MHC. There are a number of diseases that are associated with MHC. Uh, its major role in certainly clinical medicine is transplantation. Okay? I have explained those in slightly reverse order. Okay. Transplant. The practice of transplantation is, oh, goes way back in history. Okay? But people again and again experience that the organs or tissues that are transplanted, they are usually rejected because there are genetic differences between individuals of the human species at least and outbred um, animal species as well. And one cannot just transplant grass and expect that it will survive. To give you a few um, uh, differences or what the terminology is, autologous. 
refers to self-graft. Of course, you have all probably heard of skin taken from one area, transplanted into another area, and it survives perfectly well unless the surgeon didn't wash his hands and it got infected. Okay, and usually there will be consequences and it may not survive as well, okay? But by and large, autographs are accepted. Then there are isographs, isograft, isologous, like isotypes, Dr. Mayer used the word, means they are different members of the same species, okay? And these graphs are referred to as isographs. I'm sorry, wrong. Iso means the same, genetically same. I was one step ahead, allograft, that I was trying to explain. Okay, isograft, same, genetically identical. In humans, there's only one situation, identical twins. So if you have an identical, those of you who have identical twins, you're not short of organs. Just take anything you want from your identical twin. And you, it will survive. Okay? In animal models, where a lot of experimentation has been done, has been done uh, to establish principles of transplantation, there are inbred mice that have been bred, brother, sister, mated for hundreds of generations, and so one mouse is genetically identical to the other. And you can take skin from one to the other and transplant. As a matter of fact, MHC was discovered that way because there were different kinds of inbred animals. And a lot of experimenters showed, showed where the genes were that determined what the fate of craft will be. Okay? And then there are homologous, different members of the same species, Allogeneic is also referred to as, and the graft itself is referred to as allograft. A graft coming from one individual of the species into, uh, transplanted into another member of the uh, same species. Okay, and then there are heterologous, or xenograft, foreign, xeno, foreign, foreign grafts, and the reason I'm mentioning it, because there is a trend and tendency to use organs from members of other species, pig, heart valve, you probably have, are all familiar with, but there are other organs being harvested and tried into humans, particularly chimpanzees. Okay, so those are some definitions. Now, let's look at a little uh, quiz or little experimentation in mice. As I told you, they are inbred. And um, you can have, okay, I'll take the other one. Okay, you can have a Two mice of the same species, uh, same same strain, genetically identical. You can take skin, graft onto another uh, uh, mouse of the same strain, and graft, of course, will be accepted because they are identical twins, as I explained earlier. You can take another donor, okay, and um, this this should not be, uh, okay. Uh, this is donor, and then take from there. A graft and transplant it to another genetically different mouse and it is going to be rejected. Same principle as I told you earlier. However, if you took the donor, the skin, and transplant it to an, into a hybrid that is uh, made for, by crossing these two strains, here the graft would be accepted because the recipient, come on, finish that sentence, the recipient has the tissues and antigens same as the donor. Okay? Because it shares half of the genes with the donor. 
Uh, conversely, if you took the skin from a hybrid and transplant it into the recipient, it is going to be rejected because there's a diversity of one part, one half of the genes. And this phenomenon, the rejection of the graft by a recipient is sometimes also referred to as host versus graft reaction. Host is reacting against the graft, yes. Sir, you how the graft is accepted? Okay. The recipient is here. It has, let us say, all the antigens referred to as A. Okay? And this donor was B, but this host, this donor, has got A and B both. So for this recipient, the A part is foreign. Half of the antigens are foreign. So it's not going to, it's going to react against those. Okay? On the other side, the recipient has got everything that the donor might have. Everything. Okay? All right. Now, the other, I will tell you, uh, so I already told you about that the major histocompatibility antigens are the major disparities that decide, determine the fate of the graft. I also told you that there are minor histocompatibility antigens as well. It's a little mouthful to say. Um, uh, MHC, uh, there are minor histocompatibility antigens. They also affect the fate of the graft. And the more the diversity and the more strong the reaction and quicker the rejection. And that's what I just said. Okay. And they have additive effect. In other words, if one antigen is despair, disparity at one antigenic locus, there will be a certain rejection time. If there are two or three or four disparities, it will be quicker. Okay. Another phenomenon in the terms of transplantation is known as graft versus disease. And I'll explain to you what it is. If we were to take a donor's lymphoid cells, lymphoid cells, not any tissue, not any other tissue, lymphoid cells, and were to transplant into a recipient that is immunodeficient, what will happen to that graft? Would it be rejected? If the recipient does not have any T cells, or any, an ability to produce antibodies against the graft, what will happen to the graft? It will be accepted. Okay? But what does the graft, the grafted cell, see in the recipient? A foreignness. Okay? Therefore, they are going to react, proliferate, produce different cytokines, activate different cells, lead to production of antibodies and cytotoxic cells, and they are going to do their best to damage the host. And that's referred to as graft-versus host disease. And the examples here are, by this recipient had been made immunocompromised by radiation, Given the donor cells that were immunocompetent cells, those cells proliferated, made the recipient sick, and finally it succumbed to death. Okay, the same thing is observed if you were to use that hybrid, remember? And the hybrid will ac accept anything from a, either of the two parents, right? And it will accept immunocompetent cells immunocompetent cells will divide, proliferate the same way, and ultimately cause death of the recipient. Well, it is not a situation just with the mice. 
you probably all know of bone marrow transplants. Okay? Human bone marrow happens to have a lot of immunocompetent cells. And the recipient is usually made immunocompromised so that it can accept the graft, like in the case of leukemias. And that is essentially what happens. Here is the leukemic individual immunocompromised by high-dose radiation, given immunocompetent cells, bone marrow cells, and the result is the same in humans. And if one were to look at the, some of the manifestations, those are severe erythematosis, severe rash, destruction of gut epithelial cells, severe bleeding, and in severe cases, if it is not managed properly, death. Yes? What does this mean, even the T cells that have not recognized cells against the cells before the premature T cells, they go to time? If they are premature T cells, they are not going to react, and that's a very good question. We will, when we come to tolerance, we'll talk a lot more about that principle. But essentially, remember that if there were no immunocompetent T cells in the bone marrow, they are going to go into the host thymus, and that's where there will be neg positive selection, and then negative selection to eliminate those cells that were going to react against that recipient. So when the cells come out as mature, differentiated T cells, they are not going to react against that recipient. They're self-tolerant. Okay? So essentially, that's what really is the whole principle, that you make the individual immunocompromised and then reconstitute its cells by, with the donor cells that are going to differentiate into full component of both T and B cells and monocytes and macrophages and other cells. Because the bone marrow is the, or, uh, the source for the pluripotential stem cells. Okay. Now let's talk about switch gears and talk about human MSC genes. <clears throat> human MSC genes, they are two, uh, classified into two groups, class one and class two, as uh, Dr. McCallip told you already. In between, there is also a class three MHC. Why they call it MHC? It is just because it is in the same complex and in between class one and class two. Otherwise, it has very little to do with transplant rejection. What it does have the genes for is different cytokines and some complement products, and that's all I am going to tell you about class 3 MHC. Okay. It also has some genes for those uh, other protein, uh, other regulatory proteins that Dr. McCarrick talked about, that like a transporter protein. Okay. All right, so let's uh, come back to class one. There are three loci, A, B, and C, or if you want to get, have them in sequence, B, C, and A. They code for an alpha chain of class one MHC. Remember, the class one constitutes an alpha chain and a beta chain. The class two G, uh, low side, they are DP, DQ, D, and DR. DR being closest to the B locus, and also most important in terms of transplant reaction. And they code for alpha and beta, alpha and beta, and alpha and beta, alpha and beta of each locus. So the Alpha and beta chains are coded for genes within the MHC locus, as in contrast to the class one molecules. 
you will also notice that there are more than one alpha and beta subloci. Some of these are pseudogenes, but there are real active functional genes in the DR region. So DP, DQ, and DR have got subloci with that code for an alpha chain and a beta chain. Okay? And more than one beta chain in the case of DR. Okay. You, sometimes there are, we also have graduate students that are going to use a lot of information on MSC genes of um, mice. But uh, you may also come across some uh, reading that will require some background in that. The mice also have a class 1, class 2, and class 3 gene. And class 1, there are two loci. K, these are referred to as K and D instead of B, C, and A. Okay? And they are separated from each other. That's the sort of orientation in mice. That's why we don't have tails and mice have tails. No, it has nothing to do with the MHC. Okay? All right. So the, the, the class one, uh, also the same way as in the case of human, codes for, if I can go backwards, let's see if it does take me backwards. Yes. Um, an alpha chain that will associate with beta chain, which is beta, do, beta 2 microglobulin molecule, uh, to give you the full, um, nicely folded, class 1 MSC molecule that's represented on the cell surface. And the class 2 loci, there's an A and E. Class 2 antigens, both have class 2 and class 1 antigens were discovered because we had inbred mice. As a matter of fact, you see that I region is called I region, and that stood for immune response region, immune response gene. The magnitude of immune response was controlled by these genes, determine how strongly responsive a particular strain of mice was. Uh, there are subloci, beta, and alpha, and they code for the, those proteins. If one looks at the heterogeneity or polymorphism of MHC antigens. They are extremely polymorphic. These are the specificities that are distributed among the population. So if you look at over 200, and it's only increasing, um, DR genes, then they are about 200 C to uh, for, about 40, over 40 A, C and, uh, you know, close to 90. Um, a region genes, little wonder that we can not pick two people from the class that will have identical matching MHC. Okay? And it is for the advantage of the society, the, the, the species, because they are, those are the genes that determine how resistant we are to infections. MSG was not created to make us reject transplants. It evolved to protect us. So the, the bottom line is that MSG products are highly polymorphic, many, many forms. Different individuals of the species have different forms of the same molecule. If one looked at actual DNA sequence, that is what being, is being looked at now, that polymorphism is even greater. And instead of uh, about 200, there's twice as many polymorphic forms of that, those particular genes distributed in these species. And again, it is to our advantage to have those. For some unfortunate individuals who may need a transplant, it is disadvantage, but by and large it is advantageous for us to have those, that polymorphism. 
Okay. <clears throat> How are they inherited? They are inherited in a simple Mendelian fashion. And if we were to take a hypothetical family, Jack and Jill couple, and if they have certain haplotype, and haplotype is a group of genes that travel together, okay? That, that is on the same chromosome and travels together. And if we hypothetically say, well, they are DP1, DQ1, DR1, B1, C1, and uh, A1, and Jack is heterozygous and has a set of same genes from the other parent. And likewise, uh, Jill has got three and four haplotypes from the two parents. And if they have got four children, Bo, Kim, Mo, and Lee, they will have a combination of the genes, MHC genes, represented by one and three, one and four, two and three, or two and four. So simple Mendelian fashion. We inherit those antigens, MHC antigens, from each parent. <coughs> now, MHC products on the cells, what are the products on each tissue cell? Alpha chain, and that is gets associated with a beta-2 microglobulin molecule, and together they are expressed on the cell surface. If you had a defective, if an individual had a defective beta-2 microglobulin, they will not be able to form class 1 MHC and express it on their surface. And when we come to immunodeficiency diseases, we'll address that issue again. Because there are diseases, there are conditions in which an immunodeficiency of T cells exists because of the lack of proper functional beta-2 microglobulin. So beta-2 microglobulin is essential for the class 1 MHC to fold properly and come, be expressed on the cell surface. You remember Dr. McKell told you about the beta pleated sheet and the two helices that make the groove for antigen? Well, that is due to proper folding of the MHC molecule, and without beta-2 microglobulin, that folding will not occur. Okay, what about the class two antigens? Class two, as I told you, they have the code for a beta chain and an alpha chain, and they can associate with each other, okay, to represent those parental antigens on the cell surface. Now, in the case of DP and DQ, they only associate maternal beta with maternal alpha, paternal beta and paternal alpha. That's known as cis association. But in the case of um, DR, they can also associate in trans combination, paternal with maternal chain, and maternal with paternal chain, and therefore they give rise to newer combinations. So the variety of class two MHC that we can have on our cell surface uh, expands. Okay, everything is clear so far? Are you with it? Good. And also, I also told you that the, the DR region has also more than one beta chain, and therefore, there are further few more DR molecules that we have got on our cell surface. So the class two molecule, there are more in numbers on our cells that have those than class, more than the genes will predict, at least. All right, normally these genes travel as part of the chromosome, as a haplotype, but during meiosis, there is also sometimes crossover, and therefore, we can create and generate newer haplotypes, as you can see, it was, this is the original haplotypes, but we ended up with these new haplotypes. So within the population, 
there are newer haplotypes generated, and that increases the diversity, polymorphism, of the MHC molecules. So it makes it even more difficult to find appropriate donor-recipient combination. Okay. <clears throat> how are they expressed on the cell surface? So far we have talked about how they are generated, what the molecules are, what the genes are. How are they expressed on the cell surface? <coughs> Class I molecule, as a rule, is expressed on all nucleated cells. So every nucleated cell in our body has class one molecule if we are normal. However, class two molecule is not expressed on all cells. They are expressed only on antigen presenting cells. And what are they? Those are dendritic cells. B cells and macrophages. Dendritic cells, B cells, and macrophages. While class I molecule is constitutively expressed on all nucleated cells, class II molecules can be up and down regulated. And I think Dr. McCallum has told you that interferon gamma is one of the cytokines that can upregulate class two MHC molecules, and make the cells better presenter of antigens. Okay. Now, a pause for reflection as to what we have talked about. Just go ahead and reflect on it, and if you have got any questions, come up with any questions, we'll answer that before proceeding to the next section. DR, by and large, yes. As a matter of fact, D, DP, they don't even test for. Okay? Sometimes. <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay. So we are comfortable with what we have covered so far. Now, we are going to talk about a little bit about Lab. Okay, some experimentation. <coughs> and your name is? Jessica. And you are, sir? I'm Chris. You are Chris, okay? You're not identical twins by any means. <laughs> that would be freak of nature if you were identical twins. <laughs> okay? And the experiment was done. Jessica's blood, we took a few cc's of her blood isolated the lymphocytes, and we took another few cc's of blood from Chris, and we isolated those lymphocytes as well, mononuclear cells, mononuclear leukocytes. And we put them into test tubes, different test tubes, either by themselves or together with, mix them together. Okay. And since they were not identical twin, they did not get along with each other, and they decided to react against each other. And the product of that reaction was, after about four or five days of incubation in test tubes, that they started proliferating, and we could detect that proliferation by adding DNA precursors, treated the thymidine, and count the radioactivity. Okay? That simple, simple biochemistry and simple biology. You put DNA precursor like thymidine and it's radioactive. If cells are dividing, the cell will become radioactive and we could measure radioactivity. And we measured the radioactivity. There was very little mitosis in Jessica's cell, very little mitosis in Chris's cell when they were separated from each other. But when they were mixed together, boy, they proliferated but 100,000-fold compared to controls. 
Okay? That's the observation long time ago in the 60s. Okay? Then it was traced. What was the cause for that proliferation? And what turned out that Jessica's B cells and monocytes that had class 2 MHC stimulated T cells from Chris and Chris's T cells proliferated, divided, and vice versa, antigens, his antigens on his B cell and T cell and monocytes stimulated Jessica's T cells and they proliferated as well. And if we were to irradiate one or the other, there will still be proliferation of the non-irradiated one-way stimulation. And this was referred to as mixed lymphocyte reaction or mixed leukocyte reaction, MLR. Later, further investigation into it, what was on Jessica's B cells and monocytes that stimulated Chris's cells turned out that it was the class II MHC molecule that was different from Chris's T cells, Chris's class II MHC. And it is the class II MHC on Jessica's cells that activated T cells to go to produce different cytokines, IL-2 in particular, and those IL-2 molecules led to further proliferation of his T cells. Okay? So everybody is familiar now with MLR. I'm going to go one step next. Okay. And let's um, look at what um, I have got here. I'll describe to you MLR in a graphic form. Here are Jessica's monocytes or macrophages. They have both class one and class two molecules. Okay. Chris's T cells come along. They interact with the class two MHC molecule there. They produce cytokines, uh, particularly IL-2 is very important. IL-1 is also important from the, that is produced by uh, those monocytes, macrophages, and they cause the T cell proliferation. And that is what I refer to as MLR. That's the graphic form. Now, instead of incubating it for two to three days or four days, I let that culture go on for another couple of days and if I were to harvest the T cells from Chris that were stimulated by Jessica's B cells and monocytes, her class two antigens, I will observe that those T cells, among those T cells, there were cells that can kill Jessica's fibroblasts that have only class one molecule. Induction of cytotoxic cells, and those were T cells, and those were CD8 positive cells. The cells that went into proliferation during MLR were CD4 cells, and the cells that were generated as cytotoxic cells, they, those were CD8 cytotoxic cells. And you have already been told that, right? The CD4 cells recognized. Which, class, which molecule, which class molecule? Class two. And what do the CD8 cells recognize? Class one, okay? However, once they were induced to become cytotoxic, they did not need class two disparity. They only recognized, remember, cytotoxic T cells recognize class one MHC to cause cytotoxicity. Now you are going to, uh, I'm going to first uh, present that diagrammatically here. CD8 cells, okay, here they are, and they have, um, in, they are interacting with class one molecule MHC here. And what cytokines did these cells produce? They produce IL-2 and interferon gamma. And remember, just a few minutes ago, Dr. McCallum told you that interferon gamma is the co-stimulator, second signal for these cells, and that interacts with that, causes proliferation of these cells, and some of these cells mature to become effector 
cytotoxic cells, and when they associate with class one molecule on the fibroblasts or any other cell, they are going to cause lysis, apoptosis and lysis. Okay? And that is not just test tube phenomenon. That is what happens when the, a, a, an organ is grafted. Okay? Because there is a reaction that starts right away without processing of the antigen by the host or anything else. Okay? Mixed lymphocyte reaction like phenomenon and then generation of cytotoxic cells and all those cytokines that are generated that activate macrophages, activate NK cells, and they cause damage. Later on, of course, the antigens from the donor is going to be processed by host macrophages and dendritic cells and APC, and they're also going to produce antibodies that are going to combine with the grafted tissue, activate complement pathway to the lytic stage, and cause damage. Okay? There was a question. Good. <laughs> I, see, I wait for that <laughs> question. And I have got, I'll tell you what happens. Remember, how are the T cells? That is a contra, contradiction of self recognition, right? At the surface, at least. But you cannot get away from this observation either, which was discovered many, many years before recognition of self. Okay? Or elimination of self. What happens? Okay, here is the cartoon for that. I will try and explain. Where is that selection taking place? In the thymus, right? In the thymus. Thymus has cells that are of dendritic cell origin, right? That's how they are selected. Self class 2. Okay? And let's say that this was a DRW11. Just a nomenclature. Okay? And then there are T cells that are going to interact with it in the thymus. Pre-T cells. Okay? As they develop into having CD4, CD8 double positive cells. Okay? So that T cell is going to interact with this. Depending on the affinity of that interaction, at that binding, if it is very, if it is an intermediate affinity, if it's very weak, reaction, interaction, they're not going to be activated, okay? There won't be any positive selection. If there is a very high affinity, an affinity that is capable of activating that T cells to become harmful to the host, to the self, is going to get eliminated. But the intermediate affinity cells are going to differentiate, proliferate, differentiate, and come out into circulation, right? And that's what goes into the circulation through positive selection, right? Everybody is comfortable with it? The key word is affinity of binding. Okay? Certain affinity binding that promotes, encourages, and leads to positive selection and transportation to the periphery. Now, this cell that has come into the periphery, T cell, is selected on that basis. But fortuitously, some allergen egg, a lot of allergen egg, antigen-presenting cells can interact with high enough affinity to cause its activation. It's a simple cross-reactivity phenomenon. Okay? So they were selected on one basis, but when they came out, and so, uh, out of the that organ, they were still capable of binding to allogeneic MHC molecules with high enough affinity to go into proliferation and activation. Okay? Is that reasonable, reasonably clear to you? Otherwise, I'll go over it again. Okay, I will go over it again. I'm going to reverse it so that I'll reverse the, the world. Okay. Here's the thymus. Thymus has cells that have class 2 molecules. 
correct? That's how the, it selects and causes maturation of T cells. So, no? Okay. I got, I lost my thymus here. <laughs> okay. Most of us lose it anyway as we grow older. Dr. Mayer, if you look at his you know, sternum, you wouldn't find anything. <laughs> Not even a heart. <laughs> You'll find out at the exam. <laughs> okay. So, young folks like you and me have got dendritic cells and the cells that have got class two molecules. And I'm saying class two molecules just for the selection of CD4 cells. Same thing applies to CD8 cells as well. Okay? Uh, Pre-T cell, or t just before it is mature, ready for uh, transport, uh, you know, t t transportation uh, to go and find the real world, is positively selected because of certain affinity. If it was high enough affinity to cause damage to cells, okay, proliferate in response to self antigens on self MHC, it is going to be killed. Apoptosis. If it was a very poor binder, it will not be selected at all. So it's the intermediate affinity cells that are selected, transported, and they come to the circulation. Okay? However, from the circulation, if they're taken out, from Chris's circulation, they're taken out and mixed together with Jessica, yes. Uh, Jessica's um, antigen-presenting cells, they will bind with enough affinity that will activate them to proliferate. Okay? So it is just fortuitous selection that can bind with allogeneic cells with enough, enough affinity to get activated. If, regardless of what is what antigen is in that cleft, regardless, as a matter of fact, they will not proliferate anymore if that antigen was foreign. So the APC that are antigenically different are not good activator, antigen-specific activator, okay? That activation is just because of the binding of the MHC in that cleft, in that TCR, okay? So that's the basis for MLR. And the same basis is for development of cytotoxic cells as well. No antigen specificity, just recognition of MHC molecule, alloreactivity. Okay. So, what, what, what have we got left? Mechanism of rejection, very quickly, and then I'll let you read, or we'll just, it's a block so I can catch up. A mechanism of reaction, just, again, the basic immune response. I'm just uh, putting together here as a cartoon. The class 2 MHC combining with CD4 produces IL-2, TNF-beta, interferon gamma, and these are the cytokines you've already heard about. And those cytokines can act on macrophages, cause them to be, become activated. An activated cell to produce TNF-alpha and nitric oxide. And those are harmful. TNF leads to apoptosis. You were already told just a few minutes ago. And NO2 is also a toxic molecule. You know that from your pathology. Inflammation, like this. okay, inflammation, damage to the graft bedding, damage to the circulation that is providing nourishment to the graft, and the graft is damaged. They produce IL-2, 4, 5. Those are the cytokines needed for activation of B cells into plasma cells, becoming plasma cells. Plasma cells secrete various types of immunoglobulins, and immunoglobulins will bind to the tissue. That's the specific activation. Okay? The cause lysis in the presence of complement or in the absence of complement, the K cells that Dr. Mayer talked about. 
ADC cause a antibody dependent cytotoxicity, or they will produce, uh, they, they will obviously producing IL-2 interferon gamma that can activate the pre-cytotoxic T cells, they become cytotoxic, and they are going to cause damage, become lots of granules, and they will in turn cause damage to the allogeneic graft. So there are many mechanisms by which the allograft is rejected. Okay? And that's the, those are the mechanisms by which the graft is rejected in the tissue. And you will see, uh, we'll stop here and uh, cover the last few paragraphs in your handout. Uh, I, in, on this handout, I do not have my phone number. I didn't have it when I printed that. It's um, 33279. And my office is right across from Dr. Mayer's, right across from his office. So if you have any problems, confusion, the best thing is to send me an email. I check that email, cluttered with all the spams, but uh, I find it and uh, uh, would answer your queries.